Okay, good morning, everyone. I think we're ready to start now. Welcome everyone to our webinar on compliance standards for elevators and escalators. My name is Roger Neat. I'm the director of the Elevating Devices Safety Program here at uh, TSSA, and today I will be your moderator. We organized this webinar today because we realized that uh, compliance standards and TSA's transformation to becoming an outcome-based regulator is a significant change in how you're used to working uh, with TSSA and recognizing that uh, we are going live with this on March the 1st. Um, we, uh, we want an opportunity today to share with you what compliance standards are and uh, what role you'll play in help us achieve the, uh, the outcomes um, for these compliance standards. So, okay, all right, so what are we gonna do today? So we are going to run through our uh, TSA trans transformation to becoming an outcome-based regulator, what that is, and most specifically, what are compliance standards? What's their purpose? Um, we're gonna go through what they look like, uh, the components of them. We're gonna talk about what are the benefits? Why are, we, why are we trying to do this? What are the benefits to you as owners and contracts? What are the goals we're trying to achieve? We're gonna spend the bulk of our time actually walking through the compliance standards, uh, where you can find them, um, what you need to be aware of, the specific components, again, as contractors uh, and owners. Um, we're going to show you what the new inspection reports for periodic inspections look like because they're changing slightly as we launch these, uh, these compliance standards on March the 1st. And then we'll finish up with a Q&A period um, where we'll hopefully get through as many questions as we can in the event that we can, we will, can't rather, we will answer them uh, later. So, um, also just want to introduce uh, two other people with me here today. I have uh, Dean McClellan. Dean is one of our regional supervisors. Dean, if you can throw on your camera for us. Uh, there he is. Morning, Dean. Dean is one of our regional supervisors in the elevator inspection program. He's also our chief inspector for the province of Ontario. So welcome, Dean. We also have Sandra Cook. Sandra, Sandra is our manager of compliance with our legal team. And she's also one of the leads on TSA's transformation to becoming a uh, outcome-based regulator. Okay, so wel welcome both Dean and Sandra. So Dean, if you wanna kick off the presentation here. Okay, there we go. Okay, so as I mentioned, TSSA is on a journey to becoming an outcome-based regulator. And what does this mean? It's really just a modernization of how TSA does our business. It's, it means we're becoming much more risk focused than perhaps uh, we have in, our, in, in the past. Um, it means we're, we're changing how we're doing our periodic inspections um, here at TSA. And our, again, our goal today is to help you understand what is it we're changing and what role do you play as either an owner of an elevating device or a contractor in the industry? How can how can you help? What are the expectations of you? What are your obligations? And how can you help us um, in this, our ultimate goal of keeping the people of Ontario safe? Okay, we can flip to the next slide. Okay, so what is an outcome-based regulator? And so um, th this is a multi-year journey for TSA that we're undertaking. Um, and as we make this journey, we got some guiding principles that we're following. And First and foremost is focusing on harm. The whole goal um, is to do things that are going to reduce the risk of harm to the people of Ontario. It's why we exist here at TSSA. And when we're trying to identify what are the things we're gonna do, we wanna make those decisions based on evidence. So we're looking at the data that we have uh, in TSSA and, and externally um, and using that what we've, what's happened in the past to drive our decisions going forward, again, focusing on risk and those potential harms to people um, and making it proportional. So the idea there being whatever presents the greatest risk to people is where we're gonna put most of our efforts um, as, a, as an overall industry, not just TSA, but as owners and contractors. And we're gonna do that in a collaborative way. Um, when we developed the, uh, the compliance standards as we, we, we first started this, this journey, we brought together not just pe people from TSSA, but we had members of the, the elevator industry, uh, mechanics from the, uh, the industry as well, and owners. And we got together an expert panel and said, 
based on the data, what are the things that present the greatest risk to the people of Ontario? What are we going to focus on and how are we going to make sure we bring people's attention to uh, focusing on just, not just those things, but primarily on those things and get everyone aligned. So everyone's working on making, ensuring those things are addressed all the time. And if we do that, we can help ensure the, the, the safety of people in Ontario. Another guiding principle is use the full regulatory um, toolkit that we have at our, at our disposal. It's not just about inspections. We're placing greater emphasis on authorizations and authorizations is, is just the legal term for, for licenses here in Ontario. So we wanna make sure that everyone always has a valid license to operate a device in Ontario. And we wanna use those, those licenses as a tool. So if, if someone is not ensuring the safety of their device, there is the potential their authorization could be revoked at some point in time. Um, we're, we're going to be talking about the compliance standards, I said, and we also introduced a program called Compliance Support a couple of years back. And really what this is about is offering services to those people who are struggling um, to maintain the safety of their device. And we see someone struggling, we offer them a free service to work with them and get them back on the right track. Because again, that's our whole goal here is get everyone lined up and heading in the same direction to keep everyone safe. And just the, the, the final uh, bullet here is we want to re reward um, those who are doing a good job. We want to reduce the burden for people who are doing all the right things. Focus our efforts on those people who are, are struggling um, to maintain the safety of our, our devices. And, and those people who, who are not maintaining the safety of the devices will see a lot more attention from TSSA. But those who are you know, doing what's expected will see less of us. So there's sort of an overall idea of where we're going with uh, um, becoming an outcome-based regulator. And what I'll do is I'll hand it over to Sandra now, and she'll get into a little bit more details here for us. Thank you, Roger. So I'm going to talk about what actually a compliance standard is, and it is a key tool in our transformation to become an outcome-based regulator. So how do we establish compliance standards? Um, compliance standard is really a list of high risk non-compliances if TSSA finds on a periodic inspection where we will follow up. So these are the things that we feel are high risk where we need to follow up and ensure they've been complied with. Now, how did we develop those? Well, we used evidence-based and data. We used both our inspection and our incident data. And then we used an algorithm where we looked at the requirement for compliance and if that was not complied with, what type of failure would happen, what conditions it needed, and what would be the mean time to failure. And with that, we were able to bucket uh, non-compliances into high risk, medium risk, and low risk. And those that are high risk made it onto the compliance standard. And it's primarily a periodic inspection tool. And when it's noted on a periodic inspection, we will be following up. But it also supports industry in understanding what safety priorities are and what things should be immediately addressed when found um, not complied with in the field. It helps uh, owners and contractors, mechanics, and our inspectors focus on things that are high risk. Um, we, in the past, we've um, been, been not accused of it, I don't want to say that, but we've been, um, uh, people think that we look on, uh, uh, we have focused on things that are not necessarily the high risk and, and to the greatest safety. It also acknowledges that uh, regulated parties have the full responsibility for compliance and that they don't need TSSA to follow up on low and medium risk non-compliances. So what, if we on periodically only find low and medium risk non-compliances, TSSA will not be following up. Um, the, the compliance standard for elevators and escalators has been on our website since January 2022. So it's been there for almost a year um, and it's going to be available in several platforms. Uh, they are dynamic. It is somewhat kind of like a code. We will be reevaluating it on an ongoing basis. So initially, when we developed the compliance standard, we did it internally, and then we did take it out to industry for their vetting. We wanted to make sure that industry um, felt comfortable with it. So we did meet with industry, and we went through it in great detail with them. And I think at the end of the day, everyone felt that we had a very positive result. Uh, Dean, if you could go to the next slide. So this is kind of a pictorial view. So first of all, you have all of your uh, requirements for a compliant elevator or escalator. And then again, we sorted them into things that are high risk and things that are low and medium risk. And we refer to those now uh, as safety tasks. 
on things that are high risk, um, non-compliance is, as I said, are going to be on our compliance standard. And that's going to be very public facing. It has been on our website. So it's been very transparent for those things that are, where TSSA will follow up on a periodic and where there is an expectation that industry will address them because now it's very well known that these things pose a high risk. We're going to be translating that into a checklist. Uh, as Roger alluded to, on March 1st, we will be um, implementing the compliance standard along with our new computer system. So when an inspector goes out to do a periodic inspection, he will be prompted by the computer program by our, by our system uh, on things that are high risk. And that will uh, output an actual order, which will be followed up on. And other things that are low and medium risk will be dubbed as safety tasks. And the way the inspection report has now been structured is that the uh, things that are on the compliance standard which are high risk and need to be complied with and either typically is zero to 14 days, um, will be on the inspection report first and foremost, and they'll be ordered in their uh, shortest time to comply to longest and thereby followed by the uh, safety task, which typically will have a compliance time of 90 days. Dean, if you can go to the next slide, uh, one back. And if you can bring up the sample inspection report, So you can see in the inspection report, uh, the front of it, the top of it looks very similar to what you've seen in the past. Uh, and if you scroll down a little bit, Dean, you'll see the inspection notes tells you that where authority is to issue orders. It'll explain to you that we are following up on, on orders and that we now do have safety tasks. And if there's only safety tasks on a periodic, we will not be following up. And then the first thing that you will see is inspection orders. And these are things that would be on your compliance standard. You will, you will see the code clause and the uh, text for the actual order, the date that it was issued, discovered in the field, and then the time for compliance, which is typically zero to 14 days. And then if you scroll down, Dean, and then that will be followed by safety tasks. Again, you'll see the uh, non-compliance for the, the, code and, uh, the code requirement, the date it was found in the field, and the time to comply, which typically in this case for safety tasks will be typically 90 days. So this is something that industry has asked us for. I, I come from the fuels program, but I know it's the same in elevators um, that, you know, typically when an inspector did um, inspection reports for the orders would just come out how we, how we noted them. Now they will be sorted into degree of things that need to be complied with first and foremost, and then things that can be complied with um, sometime later. So Dean, if we can go back to the PowerPoint. And I'm just going to do a quick summary because I, I know what people are generally really interested in here is the actual compliance standards themselves. But the, the, uh, the goals and the benefits is we want to identify high risk to public safety. We want to have harm reduced on the, uh, on the um, uh, risk that they pose. We want everyone to be aware of the things that we think are high risk or have been determined to be high risk. And what we're ideally hoping for is on a periodic inspection long before TSSA shows up, that those things that are identified on the compliance standard will be dealt with long before TSSA shows up, thereby negating TSSA to have to issue those orders in the first place. And then again, uh, the regulated party is always responsible for full compliance, and we acknowledge that, that that is your primary responsibility. And um, we're going to be leaving it to you to, to, um, to deal with those safety tasks. And, um, and I think we can go to the next slide, Dean. So we're going to get into the actual compliance standards themselves, and we'll start with the uh, traction elevators. And um, at the beginning of, the, of each compliance standard, um, the, um, the industry was very strong that they wanted to have the compliance standard definition right up front. So when you go into our website, you'll see um, the, the red link, which says compliance standards, what, why, and the benefits. If you, you go on to that, I'm not going to ask Dean to uh, do that, but if you go on to that, it will give you the what, why, and benefits of it, That's as I've explained. And then there are other important reminders, and I'll turn this over to Dean, uh, which he was more familiar with the um, elevating device industry than I am, to go over um, um, the reminders that we have on it and then to go into the specifics of the compliance standards themselves. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Sandra. So yeah, I'm going to walk you through the website and walk you through the compliance standards. Um, sorry, I'm just wondering if my video is on. 
it's saying it's not. But yep, it we, we, can, we can see you, Dean, you're good. Good, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through the compliance standards um, and, and what's on our website. Um, so it's important that anything in red that you see here, they're links, okay? So, so like Sandra was saying, if you click on this, it'll link you to the, to the benefits of, of compliance standards. And if you click here, um, it, it'll, it'll take you to our regulation. Um, it's important to um, incident reporting to remember um, that, uh, um, you know, it is a requirement to report incidents for both the owners and the contractors. Um, and, and the links here will send you through to the incident reporting form and to the guidelines and just a, a, a reminder, um, I've, been, I've been working on incidents for a long time for, for TSSA and it's just a reminder that uh, to everybody that incidents aren't just when somebody gets hurt. Um, there's things like floods and fires and all that that are also report, important. So for the owners out there, um, it's, a, it's a nice reminder um, to go to that guidelines and just uh, it'll walk you through what is a reportable incident. So next uh, in the compliance standards, um, um, like I said, we, we have a link to, to the regulation. We also have a link to uh, manufacturer's bulletins and advisories. So if there's manufacturer's bulletins advisories out there, you, you can see them through this link. Um, so the beginning of the compliance centers, we've decided to, um, um, you know, industry, industry came to us and, and had this great idea about reminders of just, uh, you know, just reminders on things. So certified mechanics. So this is just a reminder that, you know, when everybody is working on an elevating device, um, they have to be certified to do so. So no matter what work they're doing, um, there is some work that can be done by uncertified people, but that work has to be supervised by a certified. So just keep that in mind if you're an owner and, and you know, you decide to put a new floor in your elevator or something like that, that this work has to be done uh, either by certified people or by, uh, uh, by supervised by certified people. And start, when we say certified people, we mean mechanics, um, certified mechanics. Um, just a reminder to disconnecting. So if, if a seal is affixed to your disconnect, um, you can't just cut it off. You have to contact the inspector prior to, and you have to, to uh, um, get permission to do so. Um, and then the same thing with device removal from service. So if an inspector does uh, seal the device and shut it down, um, they have to seek permission in, in order to remove that seal. Uh, maintenance control program, um, as you can see here, um, if, if you're not aware of a maintenance control program, every elevating device has one. Um, and basically it's uh, in simple terms, it, it's, like the, it's like the maintenance manual for your car. It's what tells the mechanic how, what to do and how often. And, and, and once they're done that work and it's in compliance, they're, they're to sign that off saying it's been completed. Um, the maintenance control program have, have a maintenance section um, and then they also have a testing section. Um, so there'll be certain maintenance that has to be done and then there's testing that has to be completed. And, and they, they, those things are qualified by calling them cat ones and cat threes and cat fives, which is a category test. So a cat one test, um, it means it has to be done yearly. A cat three test has to be done every three years and a cat five has to be done every five years. Now the code is very specific on, on on what has to be done. And it's important for owners and contractors to make sure that uh, that those testing is done within those timelines. So um, every, you'll have anniversary dates. So that means, you know, if, you, if you've done your category one testing in, Jan in January, 2023, the expectation is to have it completed again in January, 2024. Um, and just to quickly, um, to, to, to go over. So you see these red, the red tab shut down and the, and the, and the orange tab repair and replace. So the expectation is that um, if the mechanic is on site and, and finds one of these non-compliances that they remove that device from service and get it fixed as, as soon as they can. And if it's the inspector on site, they'll be removing the device from service until it is fixed. Uh, repair and replace, um, um, the expectation for the mechanic is, is fixed as needed. And for the inspector, they'll be issuing, uh, in most cases, a 14 day time limit. And that means on day 15, they'll be back to fold up to make sure that these, these, uh, these things have been completed. 
So I like to tell industry and owners that these are the showstoppers. These are all the things when we went through were deemed high risk. And it's important that these things get dealt with right away. Not that the, the safety tasks aren't important, but, but these are the real showstoppers. These are the ones we, we want to, to get in place. So the first little bit of the compliance standard for elevators is uh, for traction elevators, sorry, is the owners. So it's just, uh, it's a reminder to owners, you know, make sure your licenses aren't expired. Roger had mentioned um, authorizations. So make sure those licenses are up to date. Um, if you do, if there is a change to the license, say a new owner, um, by the regulations, you have 10 days to, to, to get that changed. So make sure you get on top of that. Um, maintenance control logbook should be on site. Um, your, your maintaining contractor should be able to show you that logbook if you're an owner and you should be able to look through it and, and make sure those, those things are signed off um, and everything's up to date. Um, the next is access. So access is important for, 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 for many reasons. Um, access to the machine room is important for the inspectors to make sure everything's in compliance. And it's also important for the contractors, for their mechanics to make sure that the work um, they have to do, they can get in to complete that. So as the owner, you have to make sure you have those keys on site and, and readily available to both parties. Um, and then it, the access has to be safe. Right, so you know if you're a, a stairwell, you know, stairwell is required to get into the machine room. We have to make sure that's safe. If uh, if it's a ladder, some of the old elevators have have ladders, so the same thing that that ladder has to be safe and safely attached. Um, we go on to talk about roof access. We have a, a lot of older jobs where you have to access uh, up a ladder through a hole in the roof. Um, so we have to make sure, like I said, that ladder is safe and that uh, that um, that access door is safe. Okay. Um, we talk about uh, um, um, there's no means to safely enter the elevator pit. So at one time we we had some pits didn't have ladders. I believe now we have we all our elevators in the province have ladders or have access means to get get into those pits. So it's just to make sure you have to have those means on site. Um, and then electrical boxes, it talks about uh, machine room electrical boxes are missing covers. And this is non elevator. So, you know, if your plug into the machine room are missing covers and that um, we have to make sure that uh, there's no shock hazard there. So those covers have to be replaced. Once again, the logbook. So logbook not only has to be on site, it has to be specific for that device. So, um, the code stipulates a lot of different things that have to be completed um, for maintenance and for testing. Um, and it's just to make sure that the, the logbook that's there matches what's on site. So, you know, if your elevator doesn't have a certain thing, we'd expect to see a, a not applicable in those areas. And, and really that, that logbook should be customized for that device. I'm um, getting into the machine room and control room. Um, so you know it's and make sure that that uh, there's the water, dirt, rubbish, grease, flammable liquids. Uh, make sure that the device uh, isn't being used as a storage area. You know we quite often see that where we walk in and, and people are storing things in in the machine room. Um, it's not to be used as a storage area. Uh, the, the the door is self closing and self locking. Um, you know you want to make sure the door. The machine room door fully closes. The last thing we'd want is somebody, uh, somebody's child or something, to get into those rooms. Uh, there's a lot of moving equipment, and some of them, especially downtown areas, are very high speed uh, elevators. So, um, um, once again, use the storage areas, missing electrical covers. We want to make sure uh, temperature, humidity, sign, and control is damaged, is missing. Uh, very important. Um, I know it might seem not important to some people, but we have had incidents uh, with leveling when it comes to humidity and, and stuff like that. So it's important, uh, you know, devices installed under the 2000 code of later dishes all had to have uh, um, signage put on them of, of what their operating temperatures are and humidity uh, levels are for those rooms. So uh, main disconnect. Um, so if it's, uh, you know, it, it's important that we know which which disconnect 
long switch elevator. So those, those devices should be properly numbered. Um, and, and if it's, if the disconnect needs to be repaired or replaced, um, it's quite often we see them where the disconnect is not secured properly to the wall. Um, and then clearances around electrical equipment. So it's important that we maintain those clearance, especially uh, when we're working on, on, on these devices, you know, we have to make sure those clearances are met for our safety. Uh, machine generators. So we don't have a lot of generators left out there, but we still have some. Um, but, uh, you know, um, just to make sure that if we do have those generators, the brushes aren't excessively arcing. We, we see a lot of leveling problems um, when, when that's happening and, and the brushes aren't worn. Brakes. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit more time on brakes uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, Roger asked me one time what my biggest worry is out there, and, and my answer was brakes. I, I always, uh, so I mean, brake is important that, that we we're maintaining them as per as at minimum what the code is required, and we're testing them what the, the code is required. And, and I can't stress enough how important these tests are to make sure we get them done on a timely basis and this maintenance is. So, so as an owner, um, please, um, talk to your contractors, the, the, the days of having a contractor and just saying, you know, I, I pay X amount of money a month and I expect them to do everything. You really have to get involved with your contractor and have those conversations to make sure uh, this work is, is getting done and contractors, you know, bring, bring this to the owner's attention when these things are getting done. And, and, and so we can make sure that these things are, are done uh, within the within the dates they're supposed to be completed in. Um, so uh, data plate not posted. So so um, we have requirements that the brakes um, has to have data plate with a with a, a slide on it, um, and, and it's important so that the mechanic knows um, if he's if he's uh, adjusting the brake at all, he can go back and set it up to. It's uh, test requirements. Um, brakes must be sealed so that we know people haven't tapped with them. Um, and, you know, we have to make sure that this is the maintenance section. So we have to make sure that, that these things are getting main and maintained properly. And it talks about, uh, talks about residual pads, linings, and running clearances, pins and levers, springs, sleeves. So these are all things that should be looked at when they're completing the maintenance. Uh, if we find the brake liner is impregnated with oil, um, the device will be removed from service. Um, as you can imagine, um, any vehicle, if you had a, if your brakes were covered in oil, they wouldn't perform as they're designed to. So, uh, brake solenoid cover is missing, you know, to keep dirt and debris from getting in there. Um, the drive machine brake tests demonstrated non-compliance. Uh, so, so if if your brake didn't comply to the tests. You know, you, you, you go to test it and it's, it's not in compliance. Um, category tests not completed. So uh, here you go. So here's a category test that's required to be done on the brake. Um, it's a category one. So that means it has to be done really every year. So the expectation is when the inspector's on site, um, if it's not been completed, the device will be shut down. So um, like Roger and Sandra stipulated, these are new grounds for, that we're moving. Um, and it's the first time that we're making uh, owners and, and contractors aware of, of all these things. So um, it's a good education tool. Um, and it's important owners to go to their contractors and make sure that, that these things aren't, uh, aren't present. And contractors, it's important that you bring it up to owners and say, look, if, if TSA come in here and the category tests aren't done, they are going to remove this device from service. Um, and here's the category five tests. So um, so once again, the expectation is those are done every five years. Um, alternative testing is something that's uh, in Ontario. Um, so category five tests require weights to be brought in, but there is alternative testing requirement means, but the expectation is that um, when an alternative test is completed, um, you get a report and that report is in the MCP. Um, and and that report is passed. So if it's a failed, if the if the alternative testing uh, shows that the brake has failed, then the device should be shut down and repaired until it passes the test. 
Uh, we'll get into sending car over speed and uncontrolled car movement and emergency brakes. Uh, same thing if, if your device, if the linings are worn on the device, um, if it's not of a manual reset type, um, if it's bypassed. So if, if, if you know, that, that device is bypassed in some manner, um, all these will be shutdowns. Um, if the connecting arms on a Hollister Whitney rope river not installed correctly, Hollister Whitney have a bolt-in out um, telling you the proper way to, um, to uh, install those connecting arms. Um, category one is uh, test is not complete. Um, you notice in, in this one, it's a 14 day order versus breaks, it would be removed from service. So it's just keep in mind, um, these are all important, but but just some things um, are take, take, take precedence, right? Um, if working parts of the device are not satisfactory operating conditioning, um, if the device does not operate as a result of a failure, um, and then the category tests are not completed. Um, um, if, the, if the device does not comply with a no load up test, and if the device does not comply with a full load down test, or if the device has a negative alternative testing report. So once again, you know, if that, if that test report failed, the expectation is that, uh, that device would be removed from service until it is in compliance. Next, we'll get into actual elevator controller. So SIL rated devices. So these are uh, safety integrity level devices. Um, so our expectation is that these things are operative as intended. Um, and if they're, and they're not operating properly, the device will be removed from service. Um, and then your checkout procedures are on site for these devices. So there's certain procedures that have to be on site for these devices. So we'd expect to see that documentation on site. Um, and that, that's the, that documentation helps the mechanic walk through the expectations of when they're doing that, those maintenance requirements on it, um, what, what they're testing and how they're maintaining it. Um, if we see worn contacts or relays, uh, if wiring is not properly installed, um, you know, it's just good housekeeping. We expect that the wires are installed proper in the controller. Uh, if the motor phase protection is not operative, and if the electrical protective device or EPDs don't or uh, does not remove power, so EPDs should always remove power from the drive machine motor and brake. So if one of those EPDs aren't working properly, the inspector or the mechanic will the mechanic will remove that device from service and repair it until it is working properly, and the inspector would uh, remove that device from service with expectations that you contact to the owner, contacts or contractor to have them come in and fix that. Next, we'll get into governor. So uh, if the governor is not properly sealed, uh, if the over switch, over speed switch is not operative, and once again, those over speed switches in an EPD, if the governor components are not free moving, because it's important, governors work, a lot of governors work off centrifugal force. So we want to make sure those components are free moving in order for it to work properly. Uh, if God, if guarding is in, if the guarding isn't interfering with the proper operation, so once again, um, if the governor can't open properly because of the way the, the guarding is installed. Um, um, so this is the first time we've seen this uh, shutdown or repair place. So it depends on the circumstances. Uh, if the governor rope is uh, lubricated, has rouge, loss of diameter, corroded, exceeds the number of breaks allowed. So, um, you know, it really depends on, on what the site, uh, there's different degrees of it. So that's why you, you have, you could be a shutdown or a repair replace. Um, next we get into drive shifts. Um, so once again, uh, this is, this first is for non-metallic grooves and, and just general maintenance, the shiv is worn or damaged. Um, next is hoistway. So we talk about, uh, um, CAT5 testing of emergency terminal speed limiting devices. Um, so once again, those are tests we expect to be completed every five years. Um, and we talk about uh, for the CAT fives for the leveling zone speed and CAT fives for the inner landing zones. So these are all category tests that we expect to be completed. Uh, the limit switch does not remove power. So this is the, the, the limit in the elevator. So if it does not remove power, so it's an EPD. Uh, if the unexpected or car movement device is not operative, um, terminal stopping devices, 
are not operative, safety plank, slack rope, broken tape. Um, I know as an owner, a lot of these terms are, 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 are probably you're asking what is this but you're you're this is this is a setup for the contractor the contractor or the mechanics out there are fully aware of what these things are um, and the, like I said earlier these are all EPDs so um, now we talk about compensating means if it's not securely fasting um, hoisting ropes um, so we, we um, hoisting ropes are a big um, issue so if you do have uh, last that diameter or, or your brakes are exceeding the maximum what's allowed um, or your ropes are rooted. It, it's important that um, if the contractors make you, make the owners aware of that, they, they get on that right away uh, in order to um, get those things replaced. Um, next is doors and gates. So, um, so these are the, the door systems for the elevators. So it goes through and, and, and these are all the maintenance uh, items that have to be completed. So one to 11 are all maintenance items that have to be completed on the doors. Um, and we get into the door system, kinetic energy forces. So these are the, uh, the, the force that the door closes. Um, and we talk about 30 foot pounds here. So it's important that uh, we have um, less than 30 foot pounds or less because uh, we do see a lot of incident with doors, uh, especially when it comes into seniors residence where we have a lot of uh, elderly, gen uh, elderly per persons uh, may get hit with the doors, and if there's too much force, they can they can be hurt. Um, we talk about sharp edges on the doors, category testing, um, the interlock bypass, door lock bypass, and then we get into uh, door clutch. If the door clutch is is striking uh, landing door pickup, and we do see once again um, there's a shutdown or, or repair in place. So if a car can stop in flight. So if it's striking the door and it's stopping in a flight and, or if it cannot, so either way we wanna make sure it gets fixed, but if it's not stopping the car in flight, we wouldn't be removing it from service. And then we get specific into the landing doors and we talk about the safety retainers at the top and the bottom. If they're missing or worn, um, closing, uh, clearance around the door should not exceed 10 millimeters. So this is, uh, we see a lot of incidents when it comes to little little uh, kids, especially getting their fingers, uh, the door, start, they're playing with the door and the door starts to open and they get their fingers um, wedged in there. So we want to make sure that our clearances are met. Um, when we talk about interlocking engagement um, and uh, interlock uh, brakes electric contact outside of the landing zone. So that's a test that uh, they'll, they'll do on the actual interlocks. And we get into car door, um, talk about the safety edge, make sure it's operative, uh, the car door opening device. Um, and then we get into restrictors. Um, quite often we do see restrictors tied up. Um, so it's important that, uh, you know, that, that uh, those things are working properly. And, and if they're not working properly, they're repaired to make them operative and not just bypass. So if we do find that we will be removing the device from service. Um, freight Dean, doors. Dean just wanted to give you a, a, a time check. We have about 10 minutes before questions. Oh, okay. Help so you I'm going to, I'm going to go through just, uh, uh, highlight a couple other things and then I want to move on to, uh, um, so freight elevators important for straps. Um, we see, we've had incidents in the past in regarding to their straps. We go through, um, um, what the requirements are. And then we talk about top of car, um, buttons and, and uh, stop buttons in operation. Um, <clears throat> we get into landings, um, you know, looking for car aprons, leveling accuracy, stopping accuracy. Um, and then we talk about the pits. So this is the part underneath the elevator, um, you know, where the counter light run by, uh, pit access doors, door contacts, uh, group key keys to access the pit area. So we could group one, so not everybody in the building should have one. Uh, inside the car, we talk about the emergency alarm systems, uh, communication systems, uh, phase one, which is the fire fires recall, uh, phase one and phase two. Uh, and we talk about our category testing. So I'll go, um, back, I'll go into hydraulics. So hydraulic elevators and traction elevators, there's not a lot of difference. I'm going to, I'm just going to skip, skip a bunch of this beginning stuff. 
um, but you'll see uh, it, it's the same shutdown repair. We get into the same owner um, and we get into the machine room. And, and so basically this is the area that's a little, uh, that uh, is different um, and it's the hydraulic system. So, you know, basically this is, we're talking about uh, the loss of oil. So, you know, we've had some, some bad accidents in the past uh, where we lost oil and, and, and so we have a oil loss monitoring program in the, in the Ontario um, and it's important that that's followed and that any oil that's not accounted for, uh, um, then it, there's only one place it could have went is that's into the ground. So it's important that we monitor these things to make sure we're not missing oil. Um, and any oil that's missing, if they can't get it through the collection pails and all that, we have to, that has to be recorded and we have to take corrective action. Um, we do talk about anti-creep in here and hydraulic sil cylinders and pressure testing, um, relief testing of the relief valves. Um, so I'm gonna, for the sake of time, I'm gonna jump into the escalator. So the escalator is a little different uh, beast. Um, we do have an escalator owner uh, compliance standard and we have a, a separate standard for owners and a separate standard for contractors. So the beginning of the compliance is the same. We have, you know, what's the benefits and, and all this stuff, reporting of incidents, um, uh, daily reminders, a little bit different. We talk about startup procedures. So owners should be doing startup procedures on escalators every day and the inspectors will be looking at those procedures when they're on site doing their inspections. Um, the same here, um, the expectation for shutdown, repair, replace. And then what we have is we put together a, a quick checklist. And if I have time at the end, I'll, I'll just take you quickly to look at that. Um, and then in the escalator, what we did is we provided a, a little picture here to, to tell you what these parts are. So when we're talking about comb plate, you know, that's the comb at the bottom of the escalator, what skirts are, handrails. So we kind of given you a quick now these are all things that the owner can 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 check when they're just you know if they notice this stuff on their um, on their device you know when you're doing your daily startups like emergency stop button you're to be testing that every day on your so if it's not working you should get a hold of your contractor right away. Um, now the one thing we did for this compliance standard is uh, we we've included photos so I'll just uh, I'll click on this. And you'll see uh, you'll see a photo of a stop button, you know, if you're not sure, you know, in the kind of the locations you'd see them in. Um, so it's uh, sorry, it's uh, the photos are nice. Um, it's a nice addition um, just to 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 help steer you through of, of what exactly we mean. Um, we didn't include photos in the contractor because we ex expectation as a contractor should know what a comb plate is, are they, you know, so, so that photos weren't included in, in those, but we thought for owners, it would be a nice help. Um, so we talk about steps, you know, you're looking for damage or missing components, uh, comb plates, where, you know, like comb plates, you know, you can see here where there's teeth, right? Teeth missing. Um, we talk about uh, skirt panels. I'm just quickly show you the photo of the skirt panels. You know, we, we shouldn't be seeing skirts that are worn um, like this. So these, these, these skirts need to be replaced. Uh, we talk about handrails and, and the speeds. So we will, you know, if you notice that uh, steps are moving but the handrail is moving at a total different speed, um, it's important that you shut that down and you get a hold of your contractor to come in and take a look at that. Um, guarding, uh, barricades, and then, and then landing. We talk about lighting and ambient lighting and that, so. Um, and what I'll do next is I'll jump into the, the escalator for contractors. So once again, it starts off the same way. It talks about why and all your links, it talks about incidents. It's the same um, shutdown and repair. And what I'll do is I'll just go to this, instead of going through all of this, I'll go through, I'll go, I'll just take you to the quick link. So this is uh, just a summary checklist that we thought would be, and uh, 
I, I was mentioned to Sandra and Roger yesterday that we used to work on the elevator one, but uh, um, yeah, it's, so it's just walks you through. So, you know, if the license ex, is expired and, you know, um, stop switches, if the stop switches at the machine are operative, you know, expectation is you shut it down, repair it, uh, controller, you know, if you, if you have, uh, if there's defects in the controller wiring or if uh, bare live wires are not guarded against contact or there's debris in the controller cabinets, you know, we'd expect you to repair and replace that. Uh, brakes, you know, once again, like an elevator, it's important that, uh, that these things are maintained properly and, and all the maintenance and category testing get completed on a regular basis. Um, and once again, we have you can see where it's shut down or our expectation is shut down or player place. So um, that's clear speed monitoring devices. Um, so these are uh, devices that uh, monitor the speed. So obviously they're important. So we expect those to be operative, right? Uh, drive chain device, uh, broken step chain device. Steps, we talk about cracks, sharp edges, dents, damage risers, and proper engagement, uh, broken treads. You know, so we'd expect that those those steps are replaced. Uh, up thrust device, um, we talk about it. Uh, step chains, skirts and panels. Uh, we talk about category testing, SSPI, which is step skirt index testing. Um, we'd expect to see a passing report in the in the logbook for those uh, comb plates. We get into um, you know. We're not, we're looking for broken teeth. You don't want to see broken teeth because, you know, little feet can get wedged in there. Um, we want to make sure that they're matching and they're riding in the slots of the steps and not riding high. Um, Atlantic plates are secure in place. Uh, handrails, you know, we want to make sure there's no large cracks that uh, could cause uh, pinching hazards for, for the passengers. Um, talk about deck barricades and we get into guarding, ceiling guarding. So the expectation is the guarding is present. So that is, um, that is the, in a nutshell, that's all of the compliance standards that can be found on our website. And uh, I guess now we'll open it up to questions. Okay, thanks Dean. Um, yep, so uh, some links have been provided in the chat of where you can find those on our website. So, um, and it, you know, if you don't follow the links today, you can always go back and uh, look at those again in the future from our website. So we've had several questions uh, coming in. Maybe I can just tackle a couple of the ones that I saw here. One of the questions was about, um, is TSA going to follow up 90 days day orders? And that's one of the biggest changes that's coming out of compliance standards is no, we're not. And Sandra touched on this earlier, that if it's a, a low or medium risk order that's given 90 days, it's going to be called a safety task. And we're not following those up like we used to in the past. In the past, we would continue to follow those up until those are all resolved. It is still the expectation um, that the owner and contractor will deal with those things. We're just not going to come back and follow them up. The things that we are following up are the things that Dean just went through in the compliance standards. Those things will be given, and this is a big change as well. They're going to be given 14 days or zero days, like less than, less, it could be 14 days or less. And that's a change as well. These are the really serious safety elements that we as an industry have, agree, uh, have agreed on. We're being you know, transparent here. This is what they are. This is what everybody needs to be focusing on. So our expectation is we won't find these things in the future. But if we do find them, we'll be back on day 15, like Dean says. And if they're not completed at that time, they will be removed from service. Somebody said, well, you know, if, if I haven't done any of my, my, my tests, are you only going to remove one elevator? Not necessarily. I mean, these are the serious things that can bring harm to people all elevators may be removed. So we need to get everyone aligned. These are the things that everyone has to has to focus on. So Roger, uh, they, somebody just put in there, so then why do you have a timeline for compliance if you're not following them up? Because these are things that we still have to get completed. So our exactly. expectation is that still get completed within those timelines um, so, so that they don't get just forgotten about. Yeah, responsibilities with the owners. 
Yeah. Yeah. You have to recognize that the responsibility is with the owner operator. Uh, we are going to be doing a safety audit program where we will be auditing the things that are low and medium risk to see how enforcement is going along. But I think that you know you have to pro the, the, the primary responsibility for compliance lies with the owner operator, and um, and so the, we're not following up. And so, but the, there is an expectation that you want your elevator to be safe and you want your elevator to be compliant. Uh, Roger, I did answer a number of the questions during um, during the webinar. So there were a number of questions on the payment portal and communications between the license renewal, et cetera. Um, this is a problem. We there there is there is some problem with communication with our payment portal. We are working on it, and so it, it is something we are working on. So be rest assured, we are working on it. It's a known issue. Um, another question was: uh, We are going to be increasing our notification. On, on people with their license renewals. We normally, in the past, only did it 60 days before a license was going to expire. We are going to be doing it at expiry and, and thereafter. So there is going to be no more notifications. Um, so um, so those are some of the questions that I, that I tackled. There were some technical questions about um, who can replace a light bulb uh, in, in those type of questions, which there are some technical questions there. I don't know if you want to need to go through those and just bring those up, uh, Roger, in any particular order. Well, maybe I can just tackle a couple of, um, uh, one was about access to the machine room. And this kind of ties into our earlier comments about the owners being responsible for things. Yes, an owner can enter the machine room. It's your machine room. You're allowed to go in there. Be aware of the hazards. Hopefully your equipment in there is guarded. If it's not, don't go anywhere near you know, rotating equipment that you could become entrapped in. So be aware what, 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 what the hazards are there, but it's important that you, you do go into your machine room, you check the logbook because that's how you're gonna know if these things that Dean's just ran through are being completed and being completed at the frequency that they're supposed to be. So we want owners to be engaged in the safety of their device. Go in there, check, make sure these tasks are being done. Uh, someone had asked, can we show a sample of, of how often things are supposed to be done. We really can't, because as Dean said earlier, the, the, um, uh, the maintenance control program ha has to be tailored to the device itself. So, but it'll say in, the, in that logbook, what's the frequency expected for that particular device? So look at those logbooks and yes, you can go in there. There was an another question about, is a pit a confined space? Not necessarily, but it could be. Most pits are not a confined space there has to be a hazardous environment present so average apartment building no it's not a confined space but if you're a chemical processing plant and there's a bunch of gases that might be present that could seep into the pit then yes that could be a confined space um there was a uh, the light bulb question uh yes people can change a light bulb that's not going to affect the safety of the device but there's, there's other things you can't do as an owner, such as change, changing tile, unless it's supervised, like Dean said, because changing the tiles in an elevator changes the weight, can affect the, the counterbalancing. So that's something that has to be supervised, submitted as an alteration. Um, Dean, there's a question about SIL. Somebody would ask if you could explain what a SIL device, SIL rated device is. Uh, so SIL rated, it's a safety integrity level. So it's a device that, uh... Um, it's it's got a, a, a safety level uh, tied to it, so um, we use a lot of SIL rated three. Um, the rec code requires that it, when a SIL rated device is being used, um, that it be identified on the electrical drawings, and that procedures are put in place on how to test that. So depending on what it uh, what it's used for is, uh, it says you know in the code it says. If still rated devices are used for, for certain things, then you have to have a procedure in the logbook saying how to test that and how to maintain it. And they have to be identified on the electrical drawings. So the inspector, when they're coming into the site, they would look at the drawings and see, okay, is there any still rated devices? Uh, and then the expectation is that those things are being tested and, and maintained and that those procedures are on site. So it's just a, it's a component that, that has a, 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 that gets a rating. Uh, safety rating so it could be a it could be a, a plc it could be a lot of different things that get sill ratings right and not all elevators have sill rated devices okay thank you um 
Uh, Sandra, what other ones are you seeing coming up there? Um, Anything else? I, I'm just, I'm just saying you, a lot of this come in in the last couple of minutes. Um, uh, some of these are very specific. I noticed that it, it, it's moving on me. What happens, and this is a good question, what happens when you give a 14 day and because of supply chain issues, you can't get parts, you inquire within 14 days. We're having, i.e., what happens if you get a 14 day order and you can't comply because you physically cannot get the equipment to do, to do, the, uh, to do it. My, my reaction to that would please contact your inspector, let your inspector know what the situation is. We do understand that there are supply chain issues right? And your inspector will make accommodation for you in those circumstances. I don't know if you want to add anything that, to that, Roger. Yeah, the only thing that I would add is, um, again, we, we the, these are out there. These are the elements that everybody should focusing on. So again, TSSA shouldn't be the one discovering the, the, this 14-day order. We want to get to the point where we have no 14-day orders because everyone's aligned around those. So we would probably ask the question, if you can't get the parts, why weren't you aware of this through your regular maintenance? Yes, I know some things come up occasionally, but we would not expect to find, let's say ropes, the, the elevator hoist ropes. TSA should not be finding the ropes in non-compliance. That's something that should be checked on a regular basis by the mechanics um, when they're, do, they're doing the regular monthly or quarterly maintenance. So, um, and so, so when they see the ropes starting to deteriorate, re replace them then. Don't come to TSA after we find it and say, oh, gee, we didn't notice, right? So, we, so everybody a, needs to be on top of it. I see a question that somebody was asking about a uh, machine room cannot double as a storage room. Um, and they're saying that they have a cabinet in the room that contains spare parts for maintenance of the elevator. So we, our expectation is that the equipment in there is related to the maintenance or related to the device. Um, um, so what we're seeing is, uh, you know, custodians storing their their mops and their wax for the floor and and paint and christmas decorations and all those other things that have nothing to do with the actual device itself and so that cabinet in the room that has those spare parts that's perfectly allowed because that's for that stuff is used for the device right so our expectation is is that anything that's in there is something it's it, it's going to be used on the device itself uh, Roger, this is a good question. Is if TSSA is not doing follow-up inspections except on high-risk orders, is the expectation that the owner needs to track completion? I would say yes. Yes. Yeah. Can we can we engage third parties for inspections to verify correction of directions, or is this a sole preview of TSSA? And I would say if you want to hire someone to do that, that's that's fine. You you can hire a contractor to do that if you if you if you yeah. want to. That is, I mean, lots of consultants offer that service to yeah. to assist yeah. owners in making sure things get get done, yes. Uh, I saw a question about uh, someone wants to paint the outside of the elevator doors, is that permitted? Yes, you, you you can paint the outside of the doors, but you know your painter should not be opening the doors. We did have uh, a fatality where a painter learned how to open the hall door because he wanted to make sure he got the wraparound edges, the leading edge of the door, and in opening it, he fell to his death. So realize even in, in painting, there can be some hazards. And I think we're at time. Um, we, I mean, there are um, uh, additional questions. Um, some of them are, are repetitive, like some of them are similar, um, but we will take upon ourselves to provide those answers to you. But um, I, I myself wanna say thank you very much for joining us today. Yes. yes Th thank you, everyone. We, sorry, go ahead, Dean. I was going to say this was a great session, and, and hopefully we'll be doing more on these in the future. Uh, and um, please uh, keep in mind um, what San Sandra said at the beginning, that these are a live document, so it's not a one-shot deal. Um, it's uh, and uh, although I love the checklist, um, people will download it and print it, and it's always a reminder to always go to our website to look at the most current version. Um, because these are live documents, they will be changing. And uh, I think one, one of the questions was, is that, you know, um, how is TSSA going to start communicating new requirements? And I think this is an example of TSSA trying to get out there and, and before this is implemented, get out there, 
communicate this. Uh, well, hopefully this is the start of many of these series uh, where we will learn and we'll get better and hopefully um, it, it provides, uh, an, um, it provides a, a, a forum for you to ask us questions and to uh, and give us feedback as well. But thank you very much, everybody. Yes, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, it was a great turnout today. Thank you for all the great engagement and questions. And everyone, please have a great, safe day. Thank you very much. Take care. Take care, everybody.